Thank you so much for joining us. Um, first, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and their elders past and present. I'm Malte Meinshausen. Um, I have the pleasure to work here at the Climate Energy College. You probably were torn whether um, you come to this event or watch the US midterm election. Um, and just as a little bonus, after we finish the Q&A session for the fantastic talk that you're going to hear in a second, we are going to have a political scientist from Canada commenting on the 3 p.m. status of the U.S. midterm election. So that comes at the very end. Um, but before that, we are very pleased to have an exciting lecture. Why do we care about climate change? We care because they have potentially really big impacts upon us. And one of these big impacts is, of course, food. And how does food supply change in a changing climate that we wouldn't know as a country any better than anybody else how droughts can severely change as whole swathes of land and turn a lush countryside into a dust bowl. And we are faced with that um, climate extreme event on food production, uh, more or less on a annual basis here in Australia. So it was a great pleasure to have Lisa as a PhD student to work before also with the UNEP um, program on um, various wish, risk projection projects and uh, to have her coming here saying, I really would like to look at global food supplies um, on and the climate extreme events um, on those. Um, I always try to push her just to go into the very long-term uh, stuff, but who she's um, stuck to uh, her interest, which was basically the um, looking at current extreme rainfall events, current extreme temperature events, and how soy, maize, um, rice, and wheat are going to be impacted. And it's, as you can imagine, that is a project as a PhD where you have tons of data. On a small grid level, you have all the yield data, you have all the extreme climate data, et cetera, and then making sense out of it when you have so many um, other factors playing a role, that was a needle in a haystack problem. And Elizabeth um, was um, getting fantastical big statistical Canon tools out of the shed and uh, shot it at these big data sets. And nobody else before has looked at that global um, analysis of both climate extreme data and the yield data. So uh, she didn't um, put a small thing on her plate to <laughs> chew through in her PhD. She probably put one of the biggest topics you could imagine through. And um, David Caroli, who is also um, online with us from uh, CSRO. Um, David can also talk to us if he unmutes uh, his mic. But uh, he said he, he was a co-supervisor uh, from the project and many others um, help you on your journey. So thank you, Elizabeth, for doing the journey with us and looking forward to the completion seminar. Thanks very much, Malte, for the um, kind introduction. And thank you all for coming along today um, to see my um, completion seminar um, and um, yeah, to, to, to hear about my PhD research that I conducted um, over the last several years. So today I will present about the impacts of climate extreme events on global agricultural yields, which was um, my PhD topic. And in the interest of time, I won't be able to talk about every part of my PhD, um, but I selected a few key analysis and key results that I would like to share with you today. It's not working. <laughs> um, so before I start, however, I would like to first um, say a few thank yous. Um, I wouldn't be standing here and doing my completion seminar without the support and help of very many people that um, encouraged me and um, guided me. First of all, a huge thank you to all my supervisors, Malte, um, David Crowley, who is here online as well. Um, Marcus Donat, who was um, at UNSW before and is based in Barcelona now, 
and Katja Freela from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Unfortunately, it's 4 a.m. in Europe at the moment, so Markus and Katja can't um, join today, but um, I, was, I am super grateful for all the academic guidance that my supervisor team gave me and all the support and encouragement over the last three years. Without you, this would not, I wouldn't have been able to complete this PhD. I'd also like to thank my co-authors and um, collaborators that I worked with throughout my PhD, um, Lisa Alexander, Nikolai Mainzhausen, Deepa Gray, and um, Rochelle Meyer. And of course, everyone, a huge thank you to everyone here in the college, in the Climate and Energy College. Um, I count myself, or I consider myself to be really lucky to be part of the college and to have done my PhD here, because it's a great and really supportive environment to do a PhD in, and um, we are all kind of supporting each other and um, having the college um, community is just great to kind of go together through the ups and downs of a PhD. So thanks, thanks everyone for that. Um, I'd also like to thank the ARC Center of Excellence for Climate System Science for their support and funding for me, for example, to go to conferences or attend workshops and many others that would be too many to name here. So thanks everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so just to give you a brief overview of um, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, first, I'll give you a motivation. So why did I choose this PhD topic and why do I think it's um, important? Um, then I'll give you an overview of um, the theoretical background and which kind of studies have been done before. Um, and then I'll um, outline my key research questions and then after that I will focus on the main results. So um, the first part will look at assessing the effects or quantifying the effects of climate extreme events on global agricultural yields. And in the second part I will look at hotspots of risks for impacts of climate extremes on global agriculture. So which regions are critical for global production and at the same time highly sensitive to the effects of climate extremes in terms of agricultural production. And then I give a brief summary and outlook and hopefully there will be time for questions. Okay, so why do we care? Um, as probably most or all of you know, climate change increases the risk of climate extreme events, um, such as heat waves or droughts across um, most regions worldwide. And the agricultural sector is particularly affected um, due to its dependence on um, climate conditions during the growing season. And this has implications for, for example, the livelihoods of farmers and communities that depend on agriculture. A number that I found very astonishing is um, that agriculture is the world's largest provider of jobs and worldwide close to 1 billion people depend on agriculture for their income source. Um, so that means if there are, for example, yield losses or harvest failures due to climate extremes, this affects um, a huge share of the world population. Um, another important aspect is or it also has implications for future food security. Um, so global food demand is predicted to increase over the next decades due to, on the one hand, population growth, and on the other hand, um, changes in consumption patterns. So more people are eating more meat and dairy products. So the pressure on the food system is increasing. And the um, food and Agriculture Organization of the UN estimates that food production has to increase by up to 70 percent until 2050, which is a huge number. And most of these increases have to come from yield increases because you can't expand the agricultural area infinitely. So agricult the agricultural sector faces the challenge of, on the one hand, feeding more people and on the other hand, dealing with more adverse um, climate conditions. Uh, one recent example for the effects of climate extremes on agricultural production is the recent heat wave or the heat wave in summer this year in Europe. These figures show 
um, on the left hand side the temperature anomaly um, between May and July in Europe and on the right hand side the precipitation anomalies and um, the heat wave this summer was characterized by extensive um, and very persistent um, high temperatures across um, Scandinavia, the Baltic countries, the UK, um, Germany um, and other countries and also a drought in the same region in uh, Northern Europe. And here you can see what it does with the landscape. So this is a satellite image of um, parts of Europe. So this is um, Denmark and this is in June 2018. And this is the same region. I'm not sure if you can actually see it here with the light, but it's um, it basically it goes from green to brown and um, the heat wave and the drought completely um, dried out the landscape. And this had devastating effects for agriculture in Europe this year. So Sweden, for example, reported wheat harvests that were 40% less than average. The same in Denmark, um, harvests were reduced by 40 to 50%. The UK reported um, shortage of forage for livestock and dairy farms. Germany also had below average yields. And in Switzerland, the army had to airlift water to cows in high altitude pastures, um, which is, it sounds very funny, but of course there are um, economic implications for these uh, impacts and uh, livelihoods of people um, are affected by that. The same or similarly severe situation in Australia this year um, with the drought um, in Southeast Australia. Um, you see on the left-hand side the precipitation anomalies in Australia between April and September. And as you can see across large parts of the country, the precipitation totals were either very much below average or the lowest on record. And as a consequence, um, also soil moisture, root zone soil moisture levels were <coughs> critically low, especially in the, in the southeastern part of the country where they were very much below average or the lowest uh, 1% or in the lowest 1%. And as you probably all have seen in the news, this had very devastating impacts for agriculture, livestock, um, and dairy farmers and grain farmers um, all across um, the affected regions. So these are, um, this is um, some of the, these are the reasons why it's important to look at or to consider climate extremes for agriculture and to gain a better understanding of the impact patterns to, for example, inform adaptation processes or to um, increase the resilience of food production systems. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of a background of the literature, there have been numerous studies um, focusing on climate extremes um, and their impacts on agriculture. Um, one recent um, key study by Lesk et al. looked at um, the effects of climate-related disasters on um, grain production or cereal production at the national scale. They found in their data um, significant production drops under drought and extreme heat, which you can, oops, anyway, which you can see here and here. So for drought and for extreme heat, you see a drop um, in the year of the disaster, but for flooding or extreme cold, they didn't find um, any uh, significant change. Their data uses the um, statistical database of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which is a widely used um, database for agricultural statistics. Um, this database has one limitation that it provides one data point or one time series for each country. And this plot shows the um, mean national maize production for each country. And as you can see, the, the largest producers, the most important producers worldwide are usually countries with very large land areas like China, the US, Russia, or Brazil, for example. Um, and the FAO database um, using the FAO database might mask out um, subnational processes and um, effects. And that's yeah, particularly relevant in large main producing countries. Other studies have gone around 
um, this problem by, for example, looking at specific countries for which high resolution, high quality data is available. Um, for example, the US or China um, or India, and of course, lots of other countries and studies. Um, and also previous research has looked at um, using yield data at the subnational scale. So looking at these um, fine scale impact patterns, but focused um, on precipitation and temperature variability, um, but without looking specifically at extreme events. So the research gap that this PhD research or PhD study aimed to address was to investigate the effects of climate extremes on global agricultural yields at the subnational spatial resolution using high resolution yield and climate data. So that was the starting point of um, my PhD. And the research questions that I um, addressed or tried to address were, what is the influence of climate variability and climate extremes on yields of the four major crops? Uh, maize, rice, maize, rice, soya beans and wheat. Um, I selected these four crops because they are um, um, they account for two thirds of um, calories consumed worldwide and are one of the most important staple crops. Um, the next question was which climate predictors are most relevant for predicting yield anomalies? So is it, for example, more temperature related predictors or more precipitation related um, predictors? So what has the bigger influence? And the third question was to look at the regional differences and impact patterns. So what are the regional differences in these effects of climate variability and extremes on crop yields? Um, okay, so before I start to show you the actual analysis, I just want to um, show you or provide some key definitions which are important to keep in mind and which sometimes um, can cause can be confusing. So production, agricultural production means harvested production, so everything that's actually harvested from a field, including, for example, anything that goes to waste or is lost um, afterwards, anything that's consumed directly on farm, and also um, any mark, like anything that is in the end put to market. Um, the area harvested is the area under cultivation, so that's um, everything, and the area under cultivation that in the end was harvested, um, so any kind of field that was completely destroyed through a disaster, like a flood, for example, does not, and if the farmer doesn't harvest this field, then this, this doesn't contribute to area harvested. And then yield is um, the production divided by area harvested. So it's affected by both um, production changes and um, changes in area harvested. And in my, in my analysis, I look specifically on effects of extremes on yields, so the productivity per area. Okay, so now um, I will show you my main analysis, um, assessing or quantifying the effects of climate extremes on global agriculture yields. And um, the yield database that we used to go around this issue that we are we want to have information on subnational agricultural statistics. So we used a global high resolution agricultural database developed by Ray et al. And it contains agricultural statistics for the four major crops um, that I mentioned um, across 13,500 subnational units worldwide. Um, and it's available for the years 1961 to 2008, which is also the time period that my analysis focuses on. And the data was gridded to a 0 0.5 degree grid. And we also further separated the wheat data into spring wheat and winter wheat, because these crops have um, different um, climate requirements. Um, and we used a classification from a census-based inventory. And this plot, it's just to show you, um, to illustrate the data, basically. So this is mean yield uh, from 1990 to 2008 from this um, gridded data set that we are using. 
And so to look at, I first will give you an overview of the methodology and then I will um, describe each part in a little bit more detail. So to kind of assess the effect of climate conditions during the growing season on yields, we first had to calculate um, the information on growing season climate indicators. And to do so, we used historical um, climate data and we combined them with a crop calendar, which um, gives you information on planting and harvesting dates. Um, then we did some post-processing, so regridding, detrending, standardization, which I will explain a bit more in, in a minute. And then we applied a random forest um, algorithm, which is a machine learning algorithm to kind of understand the patterns in the data and to understand how much of the yield fluctuations are actually related to climate variability and to climate extreme event indicators. Okay, so about the first part, the calculation of the growing season climate. We used um, a crop calendar. A crop calendar gives you information, as I said, about when planting and harvesting occurs. Um, here we used the harmonized crop calendar of the Agricultural Model Intercomparison Project, AgMIP. And this calendar combines two widely used um, reporting-based um, growing season calendars. And we also, um, so the, the calendar separates irrigated and rain-fed um, crops and has different growing season dates for rain-fed and irrigated crops. So we used a land use data set to classify each, grill and each grid cell into irrigated and um, rain-fed using the Merca 2000 database. So this plot, for example, the lower plot shows the rate of irrigation across the world for maize. And so now we have um, the planting and harvesting days and we wanted to know how are the climate conditions for each year between planting and harvest. And um, we use two data sets to extract climate information and to kind of crop out the growing season uh, information. Um, the first one is the QTS data set, which is a global gridded observation-based data set, which contains um, historical meteorological data um, at the monthly resolution at a 0.5 degree grid. And the variables that we extracted from this data set were mean temperature, mean precipitation, the diurnal temperature range, frost day frequency, and we also calculate a, calculated a standardized precipitation index, which um, shows more the long-term changes in precipitation and we use it here as a proxy for soil moisture conditions um, and as a drought indicator. And we also use the HEDEX2 data set, which is a data set that provides um, data on climate extreme indicators, a, a wide range of temperature and precipitation related um, indices. Um, and here we used, or we extracted uh, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, so the overall maximum and minimum temperature over the growing season, um, the percentage of days with a very high temperature, so above the 90th percentile, the percentage of days with a very low temperature, so below the 10th percentile, which are indicative of, for example, heat waves or cold events. And then we used um, the maximum five-day precipitation um, intensity, which we used as an indicator for heavy precipitation events. Okay, so we now have the yield data and we have the climate indicators and we had to post-process them so that we can actually apply the statistical analysis. So we regridded them to a common grid um, of 1.5 degrees um, so to kind of balance out the coarser resolution of the HEDEX2 data um, and at the same time keeping information from the finer scale resolution. Um, we detrended de the time series um, to remove the yield trend in the data. So yields uh, between 1961 and 2008 have increased um, strongly over the last several decades 
um, due to management changes and um, intensification of agriculture. So to re remove this trend, we used um, a nonlinear um, detrending method called SSA detrending. And we also removed time trends in the climate data so to look only at the ups and downs basically and which kind of effect they have on yields. And we standardized the time series, um, the remaining anomalies to make different regions more comparable. So for example, regions with very high yields also have very large, larger anomalies. They fluctuate more. Um, and regions with smaller yields on average have smaller uh, anomalies and we standardized it to make them, to put them into the same kind of statistical model. And then we applied um, a, a machine learning algorithm to the data. Um, so to, we basically now we have the climate data, we have the yield data, and now we wanted to quantify how much of the yield fluctuations is um, caused or is, is associated with climate fluctuations or variations. The random forest um, is a machine learning algorithm um, that can be used for predictive modeling. And it's based on an ensemble of decision trees. It can be used for classification and regression problems. Here we use it for regression. And it takes a training data set of predictor variables and the, uh, the predicted variable and tries to find um, patterns in the data. And then these relationships that it identifies are then used to predict, um, for example, in this case, yield anomalies for new uh, observations or for new um, data points. And the advantages, so why, why did we choose to use a random forest? Um, one advantage is that it's non-parametric and non-linear, so it doesn't make any assumptions about the distribution of the data or the input variables, so you don't, for example, need to have a normal distribution. Um, and also it doesn't make any assumptions about the relationship between the variables. So if you don't know yet how the relationship between the predictor and the predicted variable looks like, um, the random forest helps to kind of understand the underlying um, functional relationships. But it also allows to capture complex interactions between predictor variables and the target variable. So for example, in this case, um, different climate factors might interact together and, um, and uh, in a year where there's a drought and maybe another type of event, the yield effect might be um, magnified and um, the random forest is able to kind of capture these more complex interactions. And it's also relatively robust to collinearity in the data. So for example, if there's cor correlations between precipitation and temperature, um, random forest can, um, oh, it's robust to that. So this is just an example of a single decision tree. Um, I mean, that's a very simple example, but it could look something like that. This is just for illustration. Um, for example, it might pick temperature as one of the most important variables and selects, is the temperature above a certain threshold? If yes, is the precipitation below a certain threshold? If yes, then the yield anomaly will be minus 10%. Um, and a random forest is basically um, an ensemble of lots of decision trees, so 500 to 1,000 or how ma however many you want to combine. And each um, decision tree is um, based on a random subsample of the data and run random subsample of the predictor. Okay, so from the statistical model, we then calculated the R squared value to know or to find out how much of the yield variability is explained by the climate, by the climate predictors. And we did that in a cross-validation way. So um, we always used 80% of the data to train the statistical model. And then we did, we predicted um, the yield anomalies for the remaining 20% of the years um, and calculated the R-squared values from that. Okay, so these are the results. It's a little bit hard to see, I think. Um, so how much, how much of the global and continental yield variability is explained 
by the random forest model, so by the, by the climate predictors that we used in our model. Um, and you can see, is this working? Yeah, if you go further to the left. No, sorry, just till the, uh, at the uh, moment your dot is on the other screen. Oh. Ah, go. yeah, okay. Um, so the first um, row is maize, rice, soya beans, and spring wheat. And then the, the first bar, so the black bars, always show the global R squared values. And then the different colored bars show the different continents. And unfortunately, yeah, the numbers are a little bit too small, I think, to see. But the statistical model for maize and spring wheat at the global scale explains 50% or up to 50% of the variability. So the climate predictors that we used um, explain around 50%. Um, for soya beans and rice, it's 20 to 25% of the variance of anomalies that's explained by the predictors. And um, interestingly, wheat um, in Oceania, which is mainly, the data is mainly for Australia, um, the wheat fluctuations are captured best um, and the, the R squared value is nearly 70%, uh, which is um, the highest value that we found. So wheat is highly dependent on yield fluct uh, on climate fluct fluctuations um, here in Australia. So the next question was then, so this, the previous slide showed the, the explained variance using all of the predictors, but we were also interested in quantifying how much information actually comes from the climate extremes so or the climate extremes indicators um, and do they actually add any information and to do so we looked at two different statistical models with different predictor sets so one is the full model that i just showed before using all of the predictors and the reduced model is using only precipitation and temperature so there you capture the interannual the effect of the interannual variability of precipitation and temperature on yields, but without actually considering any climate extremes. And um, the plot on the right hand side shows this difference. So here the dark colored bars are um, the reduced model, the R squared value of the reduced model, and then the lighter colored bar is the um, R squared value of the full model. And the difference is basically the added information by the um, extreme indicators, which is shown on this side. And um, we can see that extreme event indicators increase the explained variance considerably in many regions and for many crops. Globally, at the global scale, um, the increases are 43% for maize, so very very high increases. Um, for rice, it's 27%. And for soya beans and spring wheat, it's 20 and 80, 18%. And for the first three crops, maize, maize rice, and soya beans, um, this increase in explained variance is actually more than half of the overall um, predictive capacity of the model. So if you take out, basically the other way around, if you take out climate extreme indicators from your model, um, you will lose more than half of the information. This, um, in this plot, we looked at which predictors have the biggest influence on crop yields. Can we identify certain types of um, climate factors, so mean te temperature, for example, or more the temperature extremes, or is it more related to rainfall predictors? So which, in, which predictors have the largest effect on crop yields? And to do that, we calculated um, the variable importance metrics, um, which are part of the random forest um, algorithm. And they capture how much the mean squared error increases on average when you randomly perturb or randomly mix up um, one of the predictors. And we can see here that for all of for all of the crops, the top three predictors are um, temperature-related predictors. So they're all red bars. The red bars are temperature-related. And then 
we also see that um, it's usually the same or like very similar predictors that are across the uh, that are in the top predictors across all crops. So warm day frequency, so the number of very warm days, uh, mean temperature as well as cold night frequency. So that's the percentage of very cold days. Um, rainfall, on the other hand, has a comparatively low importance. And the lowest across all crops is um, the five day rainfall intensity. So um, heavy precipitation events, at least in this analysis, don't seem to have a, the largest impact. So they are relatively, their impact is relatively um, low or their association with yields. Um, as I said in the beginning, the random forest allows you to look at, to investigate the um, functional shape of the response function between your predictor variables and your predicted variables using something that is called partial dependence plots. And the partial dependence plots, they show, they show you how the yield response changes with the in increase or decrease in a predictor. So in this case, I chose warm day frequency, cold night frequency, and mean precipitation for all the four crops. And basically, if, if we increase the warm day frequency, then the yields um, go down, for example. That, that's what we see here in this plot. And the same kind of relationship we also see for all the other um, crops. So an increase in very warm days leads to a clear decrease in, in yields and yield anomalies. Um, we can also see that a decrease in cold nights or a decrease in very cold um, days decreases, um, uh, increases, has a positive yield effect. So with fewer cold nights, um, yield, yields would improve. And then for precipitation, oops, for precipitation, the response is less clear. So there's more uncertainty um, around this functional shape. So we can't really say it's like this or like that. Um, okay, so before I showed you that temperature related predictors have the largest influence on um, yield uh, variability. However, we also looked at um, whether irrigation kind of has an effect on these impact patterns. And we found that irrigation modulates the response between temperature and yield anomalies. So we did the same analysis as we did before, but just for irrigated and rain-fed grid cells separately. And for example, for soya beans, the, the blue line is for the irrigated areas and the orange line is for rain-fed areas. And the increase, with an increase in warm days, the drop for irrigated areas is much later. So it's shifted to the right. Whereas for rain-fed areas, it's, um, it starts earlier. And then for spring wheat, the whole response um, curve is flatter. So there's a less severe decrease in yields under irrigation. For maize, it's very close. Like it's very, the lines are very close to each other. So it's not as prominent for maize. And this highlights the, the interaction between water stress and heat stress. So even though temperature predictors have a large influence on crops, um, this is still also related to water um, stress or linked to water stress as well. Okay, so um, how much time do we? Okay, um, I'll just give a very quick overview of this last part. So. We were interested in um, what, what does all this mean for global production. So we know now, or we identified main predictors and, and we quantified um, how much of the yield variation is related to, um, to climate variation and specifically extremes. Um, but what does it actually mean for global production? So we calculated a composite indicator that um, looked at how much is a region, how much does a region contribute to global agricultural production for a specific crop? So how critical is it? Um, how variable usually is the regional production? 
how much this production is related to yield anomalies. And then we looked at um, how much of the yield anomalies are actually explained by climate variations. So a region that is highly critical for overall production and at the same time um, also very highly sensitive to yield fluctuations would come out um, basically as a large um, so yeah, would the, the, the aim is to identify those regions which are critical regions. And I skip this part now. So this is um, basically the production shares and then the, the explained variance of production based on the yield variability. Um, and we did that for every country, uh, for every continent and um, crop. And just to show you the results, so the regions that we found or that we identified as highly critical for global production and at the same time um, sensitive to the effect of climate extremes where Asia for maize or North America and Asia for maize, um, North America for soybeans, um, rice production in Asia and spring wheat production in North America and Europe. Um, these are the regions that are highly critical. However, it also has to be taken into consideration that there are some other regions which might not contribute largely to overall global production. Um, for example, um, one example I um, want to highlight is, for example, maize production in Africa, it doesn't have a huge share of um, global production, but maize production there is, um, this, the share of human consumption of the maize that is produced in Africa is um, 70 percent. So, and I think in North America, it's I've, I forgot the specific number, but it's a very low number. It's um, it's uh, used for livestock, for example, and um, other purposes. So, um, impacts of extremes in other regions might have much more severe con um, consequences for the local population. Okay, so um, to summarize um, the research, so we used the random forest algorithm to analyze the relationships between climate extremes and agricultural yields for four main crops, uh, maize, soybeans, rice, and spring wheat. Um, the statistical model explains 45 to 50% of global yield anomalies of maize and spring wheat and approximately 25% of rice yield anomalies. The climate extremes have a considerable influence on crop yield fluctuations and temperature variables are, or we found temperature variables um, to be the most important predictors across all crops. And irrigation can partly offset some of the negative effects of um, heat stress or heat extremes. And we identified hotspot regions of risks of climate extreme event impacts on crop production using a composite indicator um, and there are lots of avenues for potential future research so in this study we mainly focused on yield but of course the effects on the extent of the harvested area and the overall production um, would be interesting to look at as well and also the effects of the timing of the extreme event um, and not just an aggregate over the whole growing season and also um, which is something we are planning is to look at how does it compare with crop model simulations. So how well do the crop models represent the patterns and also to investigate whether, for example, these kind of predictive models could be used, for example, for seasonal forecast of yields or, um, or harvest failure risks. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions. Lisa, time for questions. Um, and we have the microphones. All right. Uh, thank, thanks for that. For that, very interesting. Uh, one th thing I found particularly interesting was the that uh, uh, Oceania seemed <coughs> Oceania seemed to be a bit of an outlier with the uh, relatively small influence of extremes. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Is it that the 
drought signal in Oceania has already been picked up in the means without much additional information to be extreme, or do you think something else is going on there? Um, yes, so I had a look at the time series for Australia, and basically in Australia, due to the large variability of precipitation, most of the wheat um, fluctuations are explained by the very variability in precipitation. So using the temperature and precipitation predictive model, um, this already captured most of the yield anomalies. Yeah, Dimitri uh, Lafleur from the um, college here. Um, I was just wondering why you excluded um, the areas that were ruined by um, by floods or droughts because they used to be part of the agricultural system mm. and then you exclude them. Um, yes, yeah, so in this case, uh, because the there's, as far as I know, but I might be wrong, um, as far as I know, there's no um, data set that really includes the information of dynamic changes. I mean, at the national scale there is, but at the subnational level, I'm not really sure. Um, so that's why I focused here on the yield data. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Tobias from the PIC in, in Potsdam, Germany. Um, I'm just, like you showed the, the top 10 uh, predictors uh, uh, for for your yield uh, that were like mostly temperature related, but you showed that that was the plot for everything together. There was no difference between irrigated and and, and uh, non-irrigated land. Does that change if you uh, look at non-irrigated -ir land uh, or non-irrigated land only? Does then the um, the, the top predictors? Yeah. Um, I it does change, but um, I don't. Yeah, I don't recall. Um, specifically, um, yeah, I don't think there's there wasn't one specific signal that was the takeaway message. So, um, yeah, so I think I, yeah, I don't really remember in yeah. detail anymore because yeah, we did it for every continent and for every region. And yeah. I can assure you that Lisa has thousands and thousands <laughs> of plots on her computer, and she will surely find them. <laughs> yes, I'm happy to yeah have a look at it. Yeah. Hi Lisa, I'm Ben Henley from Sciences. Thank you, beautiful talk. Um, really liked your analysis. I just wondered um, with um, uh, rainfall, so when we have drought, uh, we, there is a land surface feedback. You, know, you have basically warming because of the lack of rainfall as well. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about your comments about um, you know, temperature being a major driver, could lack of rainfall also be contributing to temperature mm -hmm. Uh, anomalies mm -hmm. at the land service and therefore it yeah. also being a, well yes. I like that your method included the uh, would, could handle the collinearity quite nicely. Yes so that's a very important point so temperature and precipitation are um, correlated so under drought conditions you have higher um, uh, higher temperatures um, and um, yes yeah, so the random forest um, is able to kind of capture or oh, is robust to these um, collinearities, so um, doesn't affect the predictive power because um, you, it basically is based on a subsample of the data at every, for each decision tree. And in some random subsamples, precipitation will be in the data and some samples temperature will be in the data. And therefore it still picks out um, if, if a variable is important. Um, so, um, in that sense, it yeah doesn't affect um, the the analysis, but we were also considering which would be something that could be done in future research. For example, to use a combined um, drought indicator, which takes into consideration temperature and precipitation effects. So, for example, the SPI. Um, but here we wanted to kind of separate the effect of all of the variables. So that's why we took precipitation and temperature separately as predictors. Thanks, Lisa, for the presentation. Um, I was wondering whether you took into account uh, the impacts of multi year droughts and um, the availability of storage in, mm. in various locations and how that affects the responses. 
Yeah, so in this analysis, we haven't because we basically looked at interannual changes or interannual um, anomalies. Um, but, and, and the, so the precipitation indicator or the SBI indicator that we use is, um, it takes into account the more long-term precipitation anomalies, but we looked at the six month interval. It would of course be possible to add um, longer term um, information into that um, analysis, but here we, we haven't looked at storage or, um, or at longer term kind of changes. Let me, and David, I think you can unmute yourself if you want, um, and then we hear you. Um, from David, do you have a question? Comment? Uh, sure, I, I have two questions. <laughs> Let me ask the, uh, if you like, the, the easy one, the, the interesting one. I mean, you've covered an enormous amount of material, as, as Malta has said, and you talked about what aspect of it did you find in some sense the most unexpected or the most surprising because you've done so much that there's lots of interesting things which one did you find the most interesting hmm. <laughs> probably lots um i think for me one of the most interesting things was for example that time temperature related predictors actually seem to have a stronger association with field anomalies and not so much drought, which I expected to come out um, um, as the more important predictors. And I think um, that's uh, it's also very kind of um, scary kind of takeaway message because um, with climate change, heat waves are um, very um, yeah, are predicted to increase and the certainty about that is um, much higher than, for example, for precipitation related um, predictors. So, I think that's um, one of the most important or most interesting uh, messages that I've found for myself. Um, yeah. Okay, and of course that was more for the rain fed rather than the irrigation fed. But that leads to my second question and I didn't ask you the first one because I thought it might lead to the second one, but obviously there's been a lot of discussion uh, around all agricultural communities about the potential effects of climate change related changes in both temperature and rainfall as well as climate change related changes in extremes and how they might affect agricultural yields. So how might your work, which has looked at the year to year variability of extremes and or temperature and rainfall on agricultural yields, provide guidance or any information on potential climate change influences mm. on yields? That's a good question. That's a question that Malta probably also wants to ask. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had a lot of um, conversations um, within this PhD about that as well. And um, I mean, I, I was always um, planning to also look at the longer term projections, but in this analysis, we kind of detrended the data and the detrending also indirectly assumes continuous uh, um, adaptation to the changes, the long term changes. So in order to really apply it to future projections, um, in my view, you have to take um, absolute values and not detrended values, I think. Um, so, um, so in terms of the, so the variability of climate, um, if that, if it becomes, for example, more variable in certain regions and for certain variables, this has implications for yields in the future. And that's based on, or that, um, that, that is also something that we um, kind of deduce from this analysis. Um, but really the absolute changes um, are difficult, I think, to deduce from this study, if that makes sense, and if that answers your question. Uh, it does, but, but I also wonder whether, if you like, the sensitivity to changes in mean temperature might be more easily able for different crops to adapt to but that the sensitivity to changes in extremes, whether it be extreme rainfall or extreme temperatures, mm 
-hmm. might be harder to adapt to. Mm -hmm. I am not aware of any adaptations that could be implemented for crops that would be as easy to cope with either extremes of high temperatures or changes in frost frequencies or changes in extreme rainfall. So can you think of a way that would make a crop adaptation more adaptable to extremes rather than changes in means? That's a multi-billion dollar question. <laughs> uh, it is. It's the $64 billion question. <laughs> um, yeah, there are lots of different, like there's a lot of literature on adaptation and there are um, a wide range of um, adaptation methods at different scales at the local farm scale um, up to governmental and international um, scale and um, yeah I mean I could probably talk for a long time about um, potential adaptation options but um, in the end um, that's that's a yeah that's a learning process and it's a, it's um, something yeah I think it's it's not something that I can answer in just a short time, <laughs> which, yeah, I think it's a very complex issue. But the adaptation to extremes, even in year-to-year -year variability, is also very difficult, not related to climate change, but how do, how do you adapt to year-to-year -year variability in extremes? Because it seems to be harder than even year-to-year -year variability of mean temperature or mean rainfall. Was, sorry, was it, what did, did you ask a question or? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess the question was really, do you think that learning, well, the experience that you gather now, not in terms of long-term adaptation, but adaptation to extremes in uh, heat waves or frosts um, is perhaps harder than seasonal mean changes in rainfall or temperatures? Is that, do you agree or do you think it's equally yes. difficult for both? Changes in the variability of um, climate predictors are harder to adapt to because they are more, they make it more unpredictable and uh, they make the uh, growing crops in the, in the future climate harder. So um, yeah, so the ch changes in the extremes or changes in the vari variability of climate is harder. Well, that's something that is harder to adapt to than the mean changes that we can um, maybe predict or that we can slowly adapt to. So yeah, I, I agree with that. That's more than enough from me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, David. Um, and uh, let me thank you, Elizabeth, again for a fantastic three, slightly over three years. Um, <laughs> that's not here. <laughs> of your PhD, you brought together um, a great team with all the expertise you tapped into. You showed the persistence to stick with what you would really like to res research, even though everybody else would have had the feeling of being inundated by just thousand possible variants and questions that could be also asked. And then it takes another week of uh, crunching time. She frequently drowned our supercomputer that we have, our little <laughs> one, uh, with her analysis. So it was a great pleasure um, to have you with us. And unfortunately, others uh, got to know how excellent Lisa is. And she works now in the research, uh, in the water management research unit at the Bureau of Meteorolo Meteorology. So congratulations for that. But we hope to keep you close. Luckily, Australia still has you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly going to be a growing topic. Think of just the power of that seasonal forecast in climate extremes if we get that mm, better managed and then combined with Lisa's analysis, how that can predict you yield increases, decreases, etc. So for the seasonal forecast, it is immensely powerful too. And then if we would uh, rope into that, the future climate change, etc., it would be yeah the icing on the cake um, but that is to come so uh join me again in thanking lisa for a great day.